Okay, today is October 15th, 2022, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Gerald Horn. Dr. Dr. Horn currently holds the Moore's Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Dr. Horn is an activist, scholar, researcher, archivist, author, historian, and much, much more. Dr. Horn has written at least 46 books by my count and is considered one of the most prolific history authors of all time. Um, Dr. Horn is also interviewed almost daily on a broad, broad range of topics. You can find Dr. Horn's interviews and lectures and his latest writings on Facebook and YouTube. You can also check out the Gerald Horn nine-part nine biography series on this YouTube, YouTube channel. Dr. Horn also hosts uh, a radio show entitled Freedom Now, which airs on KP, KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles. Uh, on Saturdays at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And it can also be found on KP, kpfk.org or on this YouTube channel. We also post those uh, that show after it, it airs live. Um, and it is without a doubt the best radio show in all the land. Um, Dr. Horn, uh, thank you so much for coming back on the show and welcome back to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Um, well, today I wanted to talk to you about your most recent book, uh, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, uh, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism, which was published this past May. I guess, uh, why did you decide to write this book and how is understanding this history of Texas important today? Well, I decided to write this book for a number of reasons. One the folks in Houston and in Texas more generally uh, struggled mightily to establish black studies in this part of North America. And I am fundamentally a beneficiary of their struggle. That's why I'm here today. And I thought that writing a book would provide a kind of testament to their struggles and also provide background for why the struggle for black studies in Southeast Texas was so grueling and so bitter in the 1960s. And then secondly, uh, as an activist and as a historian, I am well aware of the fact that the United States seems to be creeping inexorably to a unique form of neo-fascism. And I thought it would be useful to lay out a foundation for why that might be so, which then at the same time uh, serves to undermine the kinds of creation myths that have been perpetrated with regard to the history of the United States, the creation myths being the founding of the United States circa 1776 being this great leap forward for humanity which certainly it's obvious it wasn't a great leap forward for Native Americans. It wasn't a great leap forward for black people who saw their numbers soar in this part of North America from the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, circa 1776 to the millions by 1861. And at the same time, you have historians and also the amateur uh, historian, Governor DeSantis of Florida, who say that the idea of abolition did not arrive until 1776, which is curious because obviously he doesn't see black people uh, seeking to break the chains of slavery as being abolitionists, although of course they're the first abolitionists. And uh, secondly, uh, it's fair to say these are some strange abolitionists because they weren't very successful since the number of enslaved soars, as noted from the tens of thousands to the millions, these were very poor political activists, uh, I might add. And not only that, but the United States, as early as the 1790s, shortly after the successful revolt against London's rule, was already uh, captaining the African slave trade to Cuba a few decades later. They were captaining the African slave trade to the largest market of all, speaking of Brazil, and were preeminent in dragging Angolans from Southwest Africa and Mozambicans from Southeast Africa across the Atlantic, kicking and screaming uh, into Brazil. 
So this also plays a role in the study we're discussing today, because this study also reveals uh, how fast and loose some of our so-called scholars have been playing with the facts. Uh, what, what I mean is that Texas was an independent state, an independent nation, the Lone Star Republic, seceding from Mexico in 1836, not least because Mexico under a president of African descent, speaking of Vicente Guerrero, had moved to abolish slavery. And like their predecessors in 1776, whose revolt against London was prompted in no small part by the gnawing suspicion that London was moving towards abolition, uh, these uh, freebooters and pirates and enslavers like Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston, who then ostentatiously, ostentatiously affixed their names to regions uh, of this part of North America, uh, they secede and set up an independent state. Now, what's interesting is that the Lone Star Republic, the independent state of Texas, instantaneously becomes a major slave trading nation. They're also involved in dragging Africans from Angola to Brazil and Africans from Angola to Cuba. But what's remarkable is that oftentimes these scholars, in terms of being fast and loose with the facts, well, speaking of today's scholars, when they talk about the numbers of enslaved that U.S. nationals are responsible for, they take a technical legalistic point of view and say that since Texas was not part of the United States between 1836 and 1845, the gigantic numbers of enslaved Africans dragged across the Atlantic by these Texans or Texians, as they used to call themselves, that doesn't count under the U.S. total, uh, even though uh, those who were residing in Texas, speaking of the freebooters and enslavers, uh, mostly were born in the United States, uh, mostly were assisted by U.S. nationals, but somehow what they do does not count with regard to what the United States is responsible for. So those are just some of the reasons why I'm, I embarked on this study that is the subject for our discussion today. Yeah, and, and the other point that, that, that came through uh, throughout the book and I wanted to highlight early on was the settlers' approach to the indigenous communities mm. in North America. And, and you talk about how there's two, essentially two approaches from the settlers. Um, can you say more about that? Well, yes. Indigenous history uh, figures substantially in these pages. I talk about the genocide against the indigenous population of Texas or Tejas, the, as it was sometimes called. And what's remarkable about Texas is that on the one hand, you saw that the settlers faced some of the most fearsome and combative indigenous groupings in all of North America. I'm speaking of the Comanches in the first instance, the one-time Lord to the Plains. But the settlers, particularly in West Texas, uh, had to confront the people we refer to as the Lapan Apaches, who also uh, had a footprint in neighboring New Mexico, who also were quite fearsome and combative. And the Texans, the settlers, had to confront the Cado, C-A-D-D-O, who had an interlocking directorate with Black people. Uh, they were not unlike the people of Florida, we refer to as the Seminole, sometimes referred to as the Creeks, who also had an interlocking directorate with the uh, Black population. And so this created a formidable obstacle to settlement. And to get to your point, this leads to a split amongst the settlers. What I mean is that the so-called liberal settlers, oftentimes backed by Washington, uh, they thought that the indigenous should be placed on reservations the equivalent 
of apart apartheid Bantu stands, and of course, a significant percentage of the indigenous population, uh, even to this very day, reside on reservations. They were uprooted and forced to move oftentimes to lands and territories that the settlers did not want to retain. But the real men with hair on their chest, speaking of the disproportionate percentage of settlers, they thought that the indigenous should be simply liquidated, uh, subjected to genocide. And fundamentally, it's that second faction uh, that prevailed. And uh, that's what's remarkable about U.S. history and U.S. historians, because in a sense, I, I imagine, I, I have to believe that people are aware of this genocide, which was not unique to Texas, by the way, in case people want to segregate that history. Uh, you had genocide from the Atlantic to the Pacific. I mean, you have uh, progressive people, so-called in Northern California, who like to burst the buttons on their shirts as they are puffing out their chest with pride about living in this so-called progressive area, who never heard of the MODOC war, M-O-D-O-C, which was a genocide inflicted upon indigenous populations of Northern California shortly after the U.S. takeover of California after the war of aggression against Mexico, 1846 to 1848. And so, on, on the one hand, you have these people in the United States who seemingly are somewhat baffled and puzzled by the fact that uh, Donald J. Trump could get 75 million votes and that uh, the United States is on the verge of electing hundreds of representatives who are called election denialists. They do not accept the fact that Donald J. Trump lost in 2020. And it's fair to infer that if they have their way, whatever fairness may have existed in previous elections will no longer obtain, <laughs> which would be a gigantic step towards the kind of fascism that's embodied in my title. So you have people who, as I said, are puzzled and baffled and befuddled and buffaloed by this turn of events. And yet, somehow they don't connect it to genocide. Somehow they don't connect it to mass enslavement. Instead, they connect it to this glorified fairy tale about uh, these men of European descent who walked on water, uh, led by the real estate speculator number one, George Washington, enslaver number one, who somehow were able to build this magical kingdom here in North America. I mean, it barely passes the giggle test, but I'm afraid to say that the joke is on us <laughs> because uh, as we slouch towards uh, this unique form of neo-fascism, I'm afraid to say that people like myself and yourself possibly will be the ultimate uh, victims, which is one of the reasons of why we are duty bound to start trying to tell a different story about how we got to this point, which once again uh, brings us to the topic for today. Yeah, and I did, one other thing I wanted to add, just as a, a preliminary point regarding this question of the indigenous, is the terminology that was used in this era that you point out in the book, um, with uh, that terms like extermination. Mm. Um, uh, were used by the settlers. Um, these aren't words that, that, that you were using. These are words that you quoted and found in the record of the day. Um, the, the number, the sheer number of tribes or, or indigenous communities that I had never heard of. Um, and one, I think one illustration of this um, was that you noted in the mid 1800s and what was then called Indian Territory, now referred to as Oklahoma, there were 39 indigenous languages spoken there. And oftentimes, you know, the history I learned was that Oklahoma was just the Cherokee. Um, and so in just this one territory, there were there were over 39 languages, indigenous languages spoken, uh, whereas in Europe, um, 
which represents more than all the languages in Europe total. Um, so I, I thought that was something um, additionally worth noting just preliminarily during this, this, this interview. Well, with regard to extermination, you are correct. That's a term that was used by the political leadership uh, in Texas. And what's remarkable is that extermination, genocide actually accelerates uh, after the conclusion of the U.S. Civil War. In fact, uh, in an earlier book, I talked about how the sainted and vaunted Abraham Lincoln presided over one of the most significant mass executions of indigenous leaders during his bloodstained reign. Uh, this is in the state now referred to as uh, Minnesota in the early 1860s, during the height of the U.S. Civil War. And so what's interesting is that early on in the book, I believe it, there's a long footnote at the end of the introduction to this book where I, I cite a number of indigenous groupings that no longer exist. Uh, they were exterminated because, as you know, in the movement today, particularly the movement against police terror, there's a slogan of say their name when you refer to Breonna Taylor or George Floyd or any of the others who have fallen victim to police terror. Well, we should also say the name of entire ethnic groups that no longer exist because they were liquidated by the indigenous groupings, I mean, excuse me, by the settlers, which makes even more remarkable uh, the sanctimony of these people in the United States, not least the political leadership, we're always pointing the finger of accusation uh, at other countries with regard to human rights violations. But as the saying goes, when they're pointing one finger, they have three more pointing, pointing back at themselves. And we need to call out the uh, ancestors of these political leaders uh, because they have blood on their hands. And we should not forget, and we should long remember the bloody process uh, that led to the creation and foundation of this country, the United States of America. Now, with regard to Indian territory, that's a story in and of itself, and fortunately has received significant attention from scholars and historians over the decades. So what happens is that with regard to the Cherokees, who you mentioned, uh, certainly uh, they were ensconced in Indian territory, so-called what is today's Oklahoma, and previously they had been in the southeast quadrant of North America. And uh, I'm speaking of today's Carolinas, today's Georgia, etc. And they also sought to assimilate uh, up to and including converting to Christianity, adopting the agricultural methods of the settlers, adopting and adapting the sartorial dress of the settlers. They established an alphabet and uh, published uh, newspapers in the Cherokee language. In fact, I drew up on some of those uh, translated newspapers as a source for my study. And they also enslaved Africans, but that was not sufficient. They still had to go, which, which is quite noteworthy because you had Europeans fresh off the boat a landing in North America, being able to reclaim, or I should say claim, uh, Native American homes, oftentimes in what I call a kind of rough house Airbnb, uh, marching into the homes, oftentimes mansions of the Cherokee and saying, you know, you people got to go. <laughs> and the Cherokee leave and these people fresh off the boat move in. I mean, it, 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 it's quite remarkable. And I, and, I, and I think that that helps to underscore I'm afraid to say uh, why many, so many people of European descent have such allegiance to the United States of America, because actually many of them did benefit. I mean, many of them were persecuted in Europe, oftentimes on religious grounds, because they're escaping the religious conflicts of Europe, uh, particularly Protestant versus Catholic, but also Christian versus Jewish. But then they crossed the Atlantic and in a rebranding exercise that would make Madison Avenue blush 
They're rebranded as, quote, white, unquote, in this militarized form of identity politics, and which makes all the more curious, if not despicable, the invoking of the term identity politics by some of our friends on the left when they affix it to, for example, what really amounts to class struggle on the part of the descendants of enslaved Africans today, because enslaved Africans were basically unpaid workers, if that means anything to these people who, who mangle labels. So in any case, the Cherokee, but also the Choctaw, uh, the Chickasaw, uh, many of the Creek, they're forced on the trail of tears. They have to, by any means they can gin up, uh, transport themselves in the late 1820s, early 1830s from the Southeast quadrant of North America to Indian territory, which was supposed to be this mass Bantu stand. But uh, alas, uh, like so many promises, the settlers do not keep this promise either. And a good part of this book, uh, particularly the, the latter chapters, tells the story of what happens uh, to Indian territory, what is now the state of Oklahoma. Uh, because just to uh, mention one vignette, what happens is that after the U.S. Civil War, uh, as is well known, uh, the enslaved or, quote, freed, unquote, at least for the most part, and the enslaved of the indigenous are also free, but the indigenous slaveholders are compelled by Washington to disgorge more of their misbegotten wealth to the formerly enslaved, which then leads to a certain kind of early prosperity by black people uh, in Indian ter territory up to and including 1907, when Oklahoma becomes a state of the United States of America. But many black people when one of the first laws passed in independent, excuse me, statehood Oklahoma, were laws mandating Jim Crow, they got the message that their presence was not necessarily wanted in that part of North America. So many of them began to flee, fleeing north to Canada. Some of them even fled to Africa. But what happens circa 1921, as I'm sure many of your audience knows, is that you have the so-called Tulsa Massacre. And what has not been stressed so far with regard to the Tulsa Massacre of 1921 is that in no small measure, it's an attempt by the settler class to make sure that the Black people in Tulsa are as poor as Black people elsewhere, that the land and wealth they had gotten from their former slave masters is seized. And that's basically what happens. That's the basic import of the Tulsa massacre of 1921. And so uh, the story of Native Americans and Africans in this part of North America is a very complex story. In some ways, it's an uplifting story insofar as it reflects a solidarity particularly with the Cado, C-A-D-D-O. In some ways, it's a dispiriting story because we find that during the time when slavery was prevalent, that you had slave revolts against indigenous slaveholders too. In fact, uh, the last Confederate officer to surrender speaking of stand, S-T-A-N-D, Wati, W-A-T-I-E, was of Cherokee ancestry. Uh, he surrenders in June 1865. Recall that Appomattox, when the traitorous, treasonous Robert E. Lee turns over his sword to Ulysses S. Grant, the head of the U.S. military, that's April 1865. And of course, Lincoln is also assassinated in April 1865. And so, you had some of these uh, Cherokee uh, leaders who fought on. Al although in fairness, uh, I should mention here what I mentioned in the book, which is that uh, many of the indigenous found it difficult to accept 
what many believe today, uh, which is that the Lincoln government, they were the good guys in this morality play because the U.S. government, including the Lincoln government, I already referred to the, the max execution over which he presided of indigenous in Minnesota, but they were serial violators of treaties. And so uh, it became difficult for them to accept that those who had taken their land, put them on the forced march to so-called Indian territory was suddenly all the, the good guys. So they sided with the Confederates. But w w one of the, the points that I've mentioned uh, throughout this study, and I'll mention it here, is that retrospectively, I think that many of the Native American groupings should have been trying to forge global alliances. Now, to a degree, they did forge a global alliance with Mexico. There were, was collaboration between the independent nation that is Mexico and certain Native American groupings, although uh, we know that unfortunately part of the culture of some south of the border as represented with the current scandal in the LA City Council is to speak uh, disparagingly of the indigenous. But despite or notwithstanding that alliance with Mexico, uh, unless further research tells a different story, and you can never rule that out as a historian because history is uh, a, an argument without end. It's a story without end. That's because new sources oftentimes materialize. But as of today, as of 2022, I don't get the impression that the Native Americans were making outreach to St. Petersburg, to the Russians, for example. Now, they, they, they may have thought, well, if you look at the history of the Pacific coast, we see that uh, Russia was committing depredations in what is now Alaska uh, during the same time. Those familiar with history of Northern California are probably familiar with an artery called the Russian River, uh, which is an emblem of a time when Russians were creeping down the Pacific coast and quite frankly, uh, were as rapacious as their European counterparts. But at the same time, we, we, we know that uh, oppressed peoples oftentimes I'm afraid to say, sometimes you have to make a deal with the devil uh, in order to escape liquidation. And bearing further and future research, I think one of the takeaways from this book that could have made for a different history of North America uh, would have been more aggressiveness of the indigenous populations in forging uh, global alliances playing on the contradictions. That's, that's, what, that's really what Black people were doing. I mean, Black people were playing on the contradictions between London and Washington, for example. The War of 1812, when the British burned down the White House and burned down Washington. You have uh, Black people who are side by side with the Redcoats. Now, I guess, you know, some of the purists amongst the Black population would have said, oh, you know, why are we siding with the British? I mean, they were responsible for the African slave trade. And we're carrying their names and speaking their language. So obviously uh, they are hardly innocent. But as I said, uh, sometimes, and even the United States, this mighty superpower takes the same point of view. I mean, there, there are few figures as reviled in today's United States is the former Soviet leader Stalin. But yet 1941 to 1945, the United States was an alliance with Stalin. And of course they started making movies. You can find them on YouTube, glorifying Stalin, hailing, celebrating Stalin. Time Magazine does the same thing. So <laughs> if, if, if a budding superpower uh, can make that sort of alliance, uh, why can't Native Americans, uh, why can't Black people? Yeah, and I, th I think um, it's it's important to understand the geopolitical si uh, situation leading up to um, 1836. And because one of the things I did not learn 
growing up was the abolitionist nature of, of Mexico. You know, I always learned mm -hmm. that the, under, the Underground Railroad went north. Mm -hmm. um, and I never learned that there was also travel southward to Mexico. And um, on page 40, you write, as early as 1824, it would have been possible to foresee a, a seismic rift between Mexico and its growing abolitionism and the arriving Euro-American settlers who saw slavery as a, quote, emblem of their freedom, uh, of, of the freedom they celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, can you say more about this and, and, and what Mexico, what the geopolitical system, uh, situation regarding Mexico at that time? So Mexico was a former Spanish colony. And as I point out in my book on the 16th century, which deals with the origins of the settler project in the Americas, one of the differences between the settler project as propelled by Spain and the settler project as propelled by England and Britain is that the settler project as propelled by Spain relied more heavily on religion, Catholicism, as a marker for prestige and the elite, whereas Protestant London, the scrappy underdog, which throughout the 1500s was under siege by the Catholic powers, pivoted and moved towards, quote, race, unquote, pan-Europeanism, uh, which allowed uh, London to then co-op those with whom it had been warring, speaking of the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, uh, even the Jewish population as well, which, interestingly enough, many of whom had been expelled as early as the late 13th century. And then uh, to move throughout Europe, those who had been warring on the shores of Europe, uh, Britain versus German. When I first started going to London to do research, one of the things that I found striking is all the anti-German sentiment. Uh, in if, When you go on Netflix and look for documentaries about the Nazis, most of them from the BBC. I mean, that's one of their specialties. Despite the fact that the so-called royal family, the Windsors, have German roots, but that's another story for another day. So uh, all of these folks who had been warring in Europe, Northern Italian versus Southern Italian, Serb versus Croat, Pole versus Russian, as I said, that somehow when they cross the Atlantic, they're all re-Christian as white. And that turns out to be the winning ticket which is one of the reasons why the United States is a superpower. And ironically enough, the United States delivered the knockout blow to the Spanish empire in the 1890s when it defeated uh, Madrid in the Philippines and Cuba, Puerto Rico, et cetera. So Mexico had rebelled against Spanish rule in the early um, 19th century. Uh, it had a, president of Mexican, of, excuse me, of, of African descent, Vincente Guerrero, uh, 200 years before Barack Obama. But that's a, that's a, a marker of Catholicism as being the way you ascend the ladder. Uh, although I'm not sure, I would seriously doubt if Mexico has ever had a, a Protestant president, for example. So what happens is that Progressively, Mexico is moving away from enslavement of Africans. The hemisphere progressively is moving away from enslavement of Africans, ignited by the Haitian Revolution 1791 to 1804, because uh, once you get an independent Black republic, uh, that upends the chessboard. I mean, there's a new game in town, because with the independent Black state known as Haiti, they can begin to forge alliances, as, as I talk about in my book uh, on the Haitian Revolution. This reflects on my earlier comment. There's a de facto alliance <laughs> that develops between Haiti and London uh, against the interests of the major enslaving power, speaking of the United States of America. And also, there's a de facto alliance that erupts between Haiti and Mexico as well. In fact, uh, there are serious plans of Haiti and Mexico 
to oust the Spanish from Cuba and abolish slavery, which outrages and enrages the United States of America. So given all of that background, it's that leads me to make to write that sentence you find on page 40, if I'm not mistaken. And you should also know that uh, shortly thereafter, I think it's around 1826, uh, Mexico and Haiti have the bright idea to try to form uh, a precursor of what is now the Organization of American States, which is this today in 2022, is this sort of US set up headquartered appropriately in Washington that does the bidding of U.S. imperialism. But they were envisioning 200 years earlier a different sort of setup. And the United States was very hostile to this project because it would have meant uh, sitting down with Black diplomats from Haiti as you know, the United States did not recognize Haiti until the U.S. Civil War in the 1860s, precisely because they, they thought it would be very upsetting to the racist status quo to have black diplomats in Washington, D.C., a city where enslavement of Africans obtained. Mexico obviously had no such problem because they had diplomatic relations with Haiti well before the United States of America. And in fact, uh, Britain uh, had uh, diplomatic relations with the United States as well. I mean, th 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 this obviously also points to a theme of our conversation, uh, which is this basic fundamental fact may come as a shock to those who have been weaned on a diet of fairy tales about the progressivism of the United States of America. I mean, it's progressive as long as you don't count genocide and mass enslavement of Africans. It reminds me of the MOVE bombing in Philadelphia in the 1980s, where the Philadelphia authorities bombed this West Philadelphia neighborhood. And then the mayor says something like, well, you know, other than, other than all these people dying, everything went fine. <laughs> and so th that's the approach that many of our liberal friends take to U.S. history. I mean, other than genocide and mass enslavement, everything was golden, which is obviously incoherent and unworthy of human discourse. Yeah, and, it, and I think that that's helpful in, in my next question and trying to understand, uh, back then they called them Texians. You know, who, mm -hmm. who was a Texian? Um, and can you describe where they came from? Um, I think that's important in, in to understanding the lead up to 1836. Well, these are the settlers. And as noted, many of them have roots in Virginia. I mean, in, in, in other words, what, what's happening, and this is a controversy in terms of Mexican history. Let me lay out the stakes. Uh, there are those who suggest that the government of Mexico which had just gone through a bloody conflict of breaking the chains with Sp Spanish colonialism in the first few decades of the 19th century, were having problems on their northern border. Today's Texas and a, a good deal of what is now the US Southwest and the Rocky Mountain West. And so the controversy is did they invite these Euro-American settlers led by Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston at all because they wanted to have boots on the ground in order to counter what they considered to be depredations of the indigenous? Now, there are scholars who say, no, that's, that, that's an inaccurate reading, but certainly it is a reading and it does not take long for the settlers from the United States to flood in to what was then Mexican territory, particularly beginning circa 
1817, 1818. Uh, this is the time when uh, Spain is on the verge of being denuded of Florida. Uh, we know that one could fairly say that in terms of North America, that the settler project begins in what we now call the Sunshine State in 1565. And of course, there are enslaved Africans and, and the so-called what you could call the Sunshine, Sunshine Peninsula uh, from the inception in 1565. And so as the Sp Spanish Empire is decomposing, Mexico is surging to independence. Supposedly, according to one reading, they're having a problem uh, dealing with indigenous uh, populations. And so they invite in these freebooters. And of course, the land they're selling the land of the Native Americans, of course, and the land is cheap because they're trying to entice European settlers, what we today would call white settlers, to come to this land. So the enticement, the inducement is to make the land cheap. And there are further inducements with regard to bringing enslaved Africans along with you. And so many of the early enslaved Africans also are coming from Virginia, also coming from the slave port that is New Orleans, because uh, for the longest, uh, New Orleans was like the Kmart of the African slave trade. Uh, it's where uh, buyers and sellers flocked uh, in search of Africans with particular specificities. I mean, for example, um, it's now established that many of the enslavers would go to parts of West Africa to basically kidnap people who had expertise in rice growing, for example, and then bring them to South Carolina. When I teach classes, I analogize it to if you had a slave trade today along the Pacific coast, and I, I, I'm using this example, as you will be able to tell shortly strategically, uh, you would have Chinese enslavers selling across the Pacific and kidnapping software developers from Seattle to San Diego and then dragging them back to, across the Pacific to China to build up China. Well, that's basically what happened. Uh, the enslavers, they cross the Atlantic, they kidnap people who have uh, expertise in rice growing, the expertise in constructing the, the sort of grilled architecture that you still find in New Orleans in terms of the balconies. And uh, then they're brought <laughs> to a place like New Orleans or Charleston, South Carolina, and then are dispersed to places like Texas. And so when, to get to a major theme of this book, when the settlers revolt, in 1836 and set up an independent nation known as the Republic of Texas, they're revolting against the idea that Mexico had moved to abolish slavery, which was in their minds equivalent to a nascent form of socialism because you were saying that a particular form of private property could no longer obtain. And just as I'm afraid to say that if at some point in the near future uh, we try to expropriate uh, some of these malefactors of wealth, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, at all, that uh, they would not be very happy and uh, they might want to arrange to declare war on our side. And so basically, this is what happens uh, with Mexico and Texas. Mexico tries to abolish a certain form of private property. Um, the Texas Texians were not having it. And so they set up an independent state and then continue to maraud against the indigenous population, liquidating the indigenous population. And, and, and before our, our, our time expires, I probably should skip ahead to the U.S. Civil War, 1861 to 1865 because Texas is a bulwark of the so-called Confederate States of America. It's also the Confederate state that's probably a least 
damaged by the U.S. Civil War, unlike the Carolinas, Virginia, Georgia, uh, which uh, are subjected to the hard hand of war, to use the phrase of that era. And you also see during the U.S. Civil War, enslavers fleeing into Texas. That's one of the reasons why Texas today has the largest black population in the United States, because the enslavers were fleeing with their property, speaking of black people, uh, into Texas. And so what happens is that Mexico, uh, during this period, 1861 to 1865, it's occupied by France. The enslaving class in North America, after Robert E. Lee, the traitor, surrenders in 1865, they have the idea that they're going to continue to fight in alignment with French-occupied Mexico. So what happens in terms of the story that I tell, number one, with regard to Juneteenth, this holiday, which I mark, and I'm happy to see that it is now a holiday, the traditional story, June 19th, 1865, General Granger of the Lincoln Army shows up in Galveston and tells the Negroes you're free, which is sort of uh, a fallacious tale in the sense that uh, it's a fallacious tale insofar as it presupposes that the Negroes were free, but somehow they weren't free. When actually, it would be as if in Washington, a resolution was passed saying that anybody deemed to be enslaved in Mauritania, Northwest Africa, is now free. Well, unless the United States puts boots on the ground and sends men and women with rifles, uh, that has as much significance as the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863, had in Texas, because Texas was not under the jurisdiction of the United States in 1863. So what happens is that with Juneteenth, however, which, by the way, was uh, enforced at gunpoint, uh, including a complement of black troops in blue U.S. military uniforms as well. Juneteenth was not the end of the story because the enslavers were going to continue the war, as noted, from French-occupied Mexico. In fact, as I tell the story, the French, with their allies in Africa, recall that the French had occupied Algeria uh, in 1830, forced out at gunpoint in 1962. So the French began to transport black soldiers from Africa to bolster their puppet regime in Mexico City. I speculate that some of the black soldiers under the French flag who wind up in Mexico probably wind up in Texas, Certainly, many of them wind up staying in Mexico. But in any case, there's another Juneteenth, which is June 19th, 1867, when the French puppet Maximilian is captured in a joint process involving progressive Mexicans under the regime of Mexican leader and national hero Benito Juarez and black troops in the Union Blue, and he's executed on June 19, 1867. And that Juneteenth actually brings us closer to a truer emancipation than the original Juneteenth, June 19, 1865. And whenever I speak on this subject, I also am keen to note that uh, one of the more unfortunate aspects of Black history has been the Buffalo Soldiers, these aforementioned Black soldiers in blue, because one of their major ventures after slavery is abolished is routing the indigenous population of Texas and of the U.S. Southwest. And what was going on was incoherent and inherently contradictory, because in East Texas, you had the Klan uh, plundering Black people, in, in fact, uh, one of the contributions that Texas lynchers make to that barbaric and gruesome practice 
is to boil black victims in petroleum, because as you know, this is an oil state. And so at the same time, this is going on in East Texas, you have black soldiers in blue in West Texas routing and plundering Native Americans. It's, it's, it's totally incoherent. Um, to a certain degree, one has to blame leaders like Frederick Douglass, who should have been more diligent. Uh, I'm giving a talk in a few days, and one of the things I'm going to point out is that there are certain leaders uh, who excel during certain historical periods and do not do as well in other historical periods. And uh, my example is Frederick Douglass. 1845, uh, he's in Britain, the major antagonist of Washington. Britain and the United States are jousting over all, oh so many issues, yet he spends 19 months there, basically. It would be as if uh, you had a, an antagonist of the United States today where some black leader decides to say to spend 19 months organizing in Beijing or Moscow uh, against the United States. But then after the U.S. Civil War, Douglas apparently feels that uh, a landmark has been reached. He does not visit Europe again until 1886. I mean, I think a more adroit, adept leadership should have recognized that with all of the bloodshed that led to the U.S. Civil War and the Constitutional Amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, that uh, that did not necessarily mean the end of the story, <laughs> obviously, since we're still struggling today. And certainly that should have been painfully obvious uh, post-1865. But once again, that's another subject for another day. Yeah. And, um... I know we're sort of running out of time, but I, I did want to highlight, um, you know, a little bit more about the, the Texians, um, just to give, because I, uh, to give people an idea, the ninety percent of the settlers came from from the South. Um, one of the things that, you know, we we sort of learn from westerns and and cowboy and, and Indian movies was that the they try to they try to paint the picture that the Indians were were the scalpers, uh, but but in your book you outline it was the, the settlers were the scalpers and they even had scalping festivals. Right. Um, and and, and to one other point that maybe to add for you to comment on is the who were the Texas Rangers, mm -hmm. you know, the vaunted the vaunted Texas Rangers, for whom a baseball team is now known. Uh, speaking of the perpetually losing franchise to North and, and Dallas. So, they, they, and fundamentally they were a kind of death squad. Um, many of your listeners may be, and viewers may be familiar with the death squads of Central America and El Salvador and thereabouts uh, in the 1980s, oftentimes sponsored by US imperialism. Well, uh, you had something similar uh, here in uh, Texas. And of course, uh, they not only were routing the indigenous population, they were routing the, the Mexican population as, as well, and the Mexican American population as well, uh, because a strategic objective of the so called white settlers was to drive a wedge between the black population on the one hand and the indigenous population on the other hand, and to drive a wedge between the black population on the one hand and the population of Mexican origin on the other, which once again brings us to this unfortunately tragic episode in the LA City Council, uh, where you have uh, some of the representatives of Latino origin making disparaging comments about uh, black people, about people from Oaxaca and Mexico, about Armenians. I mean, the, the list is long. And in some ways, this carries out the strategic objective 
of the settlers of driving a wedge between and amongst afflicted communities. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why communities, particularly in Southern California, uh, have reacted so strongly uh, to this episode because I think that instinctively they're aware of the stakes at play. And so uh, there have been books subsequently written about the Texas Rangers and their depredations on people of Mexican origin. In fact, in my book, Black and Brown, African Americans, the Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 1920, I talk about that to a certain extent because uh, some of the bloodshed amongst the Texas-Mexico border during that decade, 1910 to 1920, uh, looking back, it, it's, it's still rather breathtaking. It, it, it's still of, of a scope and enormity uh, that is mind boggling. So I'm glad that you raised the question of the Texas Rangers because uh, they have a lot to apologize for. 